Okay, today we are talking with Richard Hartman with Grafana Labs, an intro to open source observability with Grafana, Prometheus, Loki, and Tempo. Everyone, please uh, remember that during the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee. You're using the chat I see already, so say hello and for Richard. Um, we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end, and um, we can even stay on a little bit longer since we're running late to take care of that. This is an official, official webinar of the CNCF and as such is a subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct, and please be respectful of your participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page under online programs. They were also available via this registration link, which will take you to our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Richard so we can kick things off. Thank you again for having everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Word of warning, I keep getting pop-ups from, from the platform that my internet connection is unstable, uh, which I don't believe is the case, but something is 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 broken-ish. So if I drop or anything, um, I'll try to rejoin. Um, so let's get started. Intro to op open source observability. A um, little bit of, of, of validating. Um, that most of my life I've worked in, in engineering, architecture, operational roles. Um, so I, I have strong opinions about about the right tools uh, and and about not perfect or not good enough tools. Oftentimes um, you have this this parrot thing where uh, where you have breaks between different media, where you have breaks between different um, trains of thought, like how to how to index your data, how how the mental modeling works. Maybe one thing has the one color, the other thing has the other color, or one thing is left to right, the other is right to left. Doesn't matter. Uh, you have breaks between your different systems too often, which in turn means uh, that way too often you um, you end up paying extra cost in mental overhead or in in automation overhead. It's not seamless. You need to switch mental modes when you go from your logs to your traces or what have you, which um, is is not nice and it just it adds friction and you don't really need that at like five in the morning on a Sunday when you've got when you've gotten a, a pager. So let's try and rethink uh, what what we actually want to do here. And I'm going to to go through a little bit of of like the philosophy of observability and a few buzzwords um, as a as a foundation, let's say, um, for what we are then talking about. Um, there is. Um, a thing where where cloud native scale is basically what internet scale uh, was two decades ago, and that's kind of important to keep in mind because a lot of of issues which we see in the cloud native world have already been solved in different contexts um, before us, and it's always a good idea to to look at what engineers before us did to to solve problems, like not the specific implementations, because usually they don't fit their age uh, if they're too old or the new age, um, but the underlying concepts, like for example, um, computer networks, the internet, um, also power networks, a lot of those tend to run on metrics, because this is already a pre-distillation of, um, of what you care about as, as a domain subject expert. Um, so it's, it's always good to look back at what has been done before and what worked, not from the specific implementation, but from a, an engineering point of view. As always in tech, we have buzzwords. Um, buzzwords are usually, usually they have a kernel of truth, um, but um, by the time there are buzzwords, they have lost most of that meaning. Um, which is a pity, but it also stands like why they were so successful. Um, of particular note is, is cargo culting. Cargo culting is uh, defined as observing behavior and observing success or results of that behavior and emulating that behavior without actually applying the underlying thought or, or fundamental engineering practices. Um, it comes from, from um, indigenous people who observed um, 
uh, soldiers building building runways for planes and small control towers and such and then the gods sent sent uh, stuff from heavens which was basically just uh, logistics of the army but the perception was that just by building runways and such uh, you could get gifts from the gods and to this day uh, those those things still echo in in a few uh, religions so that is observed behavior it becomes part of culture but it not, it's not actually doing anything it's not actually pursuing the uh, the goals or or the the underlying um rational and that's something which you always need to be worried about it's not about just changing the name for a thing and anyone who was a sys admin yesterday is a SRE today and you're done it's about actually changing the behavior and actually understanding why something is successful not just observing that it is successful monitoring while i personally uh, use monitoring and observability more or less interchangeably um under this buzzwordy definition, monitoring has taken a little bit of a meaning of collecting data, not using it. Um, you have two extremes in this. One takes uh, one thing where you have the full text indexing, where you just, in in a vain attempt, go after everything which you can find, or data lake, which outside of batch analysis is often a euphemism for um, no one is ever going to look at the thing. Um, observability is is trying to reframe that a little bit um, about being able to ask new questions, just observe what inputs, what outputs a system has and being able to deduce the internal state of that system um, from those inputs and outputs, as in ask questions which you didn't know you wanted to, um, to ask before. And that enables humans to understand complex systems, but it also allows you to automate a lot of this. So it's not just about determining that something is in a certain state, it's also about determining why it is in a certain state and ideally how to get it out of that state. Um, if you cannot ask questions on the fly, like new questions, it's just not observability. Another super important concept is complexity, uh, where you have what I call fake complexity, aka bad design, uh, which you can reduce and you should reduce in my opinion, like unless you have other engineering constraints like, I don't know, money, GTM, Maybe, maybe compliance reasons, what have you, but outside of, of actually reasons why you have complexity, you should always strive to get rid of complexity. But you have real system inherent pro, uh, complexity as well. And that can be moved, but it cannot be made to go away. Like state is always someone else's problem. You have all your microservices, they are stateless, but someone has to maintain the database. Um, so that, that complexity has to live somewhere. Um, so yeah, you can move it back and forth. You can compartmentalize, and in my opinion, my strong opinion, you should compartmentalize it, and you should distill it meaningfully. And we have two different definitions of um, of distilling this: a, the APIs towards whatever the consumer slash user of the thing is, and b, already start thinking about what you need to emit towards the observers, towards your operational teams, so they can look at the thing. Um, that is basically SLIs. Um, SLI, SLO, SLA. Oftentimes people are confused what they mean. It's really, really simple. SLI are service level indicators, what you measure. Objectives are what you need to hit. And agreements is when you need to start paying because someone uh, broke a contract. Um, a lot of, of SRE to me is about aligning incentives across the org. Because if you have devs, they want to ship code, then they want to ship new releases, ASAP. You have operational people who are paid for, for stuff not breaking. So you have diametri diametrically opposed incentives where the one group wants to move super quickly and the other group wants to move rather slowly and carefully. And so they always they always fight, they always have strife, because that's built into literally into their compensation structure and into their complete organizational structure. Whereas one of the main things of SRE to me is the concept of error budgets, where everyone shares a budget for how many errors a thing can have. And if you hit those budgets, it's fine, but it doesn't matter if this is due to new features or A-B testing or a new deployment where the PM needs something really, really urgently or things always breaking. If things break too often in operations, the devs don't have error budget for their testing and deployment uh, velocity anymore. So you align those incentives. Another nice thing is if you're able to build a shared understanding, not 
just align incentives between people. Um, and that's where dashboards are coming in, where all those dashboards ideally are shared between all those different teams. Because then you have an incentive to invest in shared tooling and everyone improves a little bit and everyone else benefits from the thing. You pool all your institution knowledge around a thing um, from a lot of different angles and everyone works together in making this better. It also means you're building the same language and you build the same understanding. Everyone has the same dashboard. The PM doesn't need to fight uh, the engineers about what that one metric is. Of course, they literally look at the same data. They don't use different words for different aspects. Of course, all of them use the same dashboards, the same alerts, the same reports, which in turn means they use the same language. Services, another super important concept. Um, they could basically compartmentalize complexity. And if you remember just now I said, one of those two uh, abstraction layers would be an interface towards the user. Um, they usually have different owners and teams. Obviously, teams can have or own more than one service, but by and large, they, they tend to have their own groups of, of whoever is responsible, and contracts define their interfaces. I like the term contract a lot. Uh, of course, it is, it is commonly defined as a written agreement which must not be broken and you actually write it down and you agree it and you sign it so you have an agreement and by writing things down and making things explicit a lot of those implicit misunderstandings just go away because once it's written down and agreed and that's the basis for what you actually do and how you operate a lot of people will take a second and third look and actually start negotiating details instead of everyone being like yeah whatever it'll work and then it breaks and everyone is fighting why it broke and then you realize that you had a lot of misunderstandings doesn't matter if the customers or consumers are internal or external, um, treat them as if they were external. Um, of course, they are depending on your thing. Anyone coming from networking like myself, um, layers are another um, way of, of thinking about this. The internet wouldn't exist without proper layering. Of course, I can literally rip out uh, layer one and layer two and I have instead of Ethernet, I have Wi-Fi or what have you. And that wouldn't be possible without those clean and long-term stable interfaces between the different layers. Other things like CPUs, hard disk, compute nodes, your lunch, even if you cook from scratch, you will not grow every last cucumber yourself. You have certain interfaces where you buy other services and, and just consume those. Alerting, also super important. Um, Customers don't care if, I don't know, you have 20 database uh, nodes. They don't care if, if 15 of them are down or five of them are down or all of them are healthy. They care about that service which they are consuming being healthy and responsive and what have you. So that's the perspective to mainly take. Define your SLAs, your SLIs, your SLOs from that perspective of is it user interfacing or is it user visible? The nice thing if you do this in depth what is your provider's SLA and SLI is perfect for you to debug. Of course, if that database is down, you don't need to debug why your web shop is not working. You kind of know. Um, so you, you structure, again, you use the same language across the complete stack of what you're doing. Important to avoid burnout. Anything or anything which is currently or imminenting customers must be alerted upon and nothing else. Raise a ticket, do it during business hours if it's not customer impacting. Just don't, of course, you'll burn out. So that's the intro part. Now gets to the tech part. Prometheus. Prometheus, if you don't know, is inspired by Google, Google's Borgmon. It's a time series database. Uh, internally, it uses 64-bit values for pretty much everything which is relevant. There's thousands or tens of thousands of, inst well, thousands of instrumentations and exporters um, that are public. Um, there's millions of installations of Prometheus. Um, it's not for long done by a Grafana. Main selling points, built-in services cover. Netis will notice um, that next, like not impossible, but very uncommon to run Kubernetes without a Prometheus of some sort, because they are literally designed from each other, even back from the Google Borg and Borgmon days, and more or less by a happy little accident uh, with Kubernetes and Prometheus within CNCF. And lo and behold, those are the two founding projects of CNCF. 
they go together. Um, you haven't you have no hierarchical data model, so you don't have your I don't know your region, your your city, your customer, and then you need to uh, select by customer, and all of a sudden you need to walk up your hierarchical data model, you need to walk down, blah blah blah. No, you have an n-dimensional label set which you slice and dice as you need it. So you se select by label customer equals x, and you're done. PromQL is a functional level, uh, a functional language which allows you to do vector math on on um, on your data. Um, which is super efficient, like highly efficient. In particular, of course, the label matches, matching usually does more or less by magic what you want. And this is used for everything, processing, graphing, alerting, exporting data. Every every way you work on the data is always through PromQL. So it's a language you have to learn, but it's the one language and then everything works. Simple operation, don't need to convince you probably, highly efficient. It's pull based for good reason. Of course, this makes a lot of things easier uh, to reason about about correctness and up to date correctness of the state of of the wider system. Push versus pull is a borderline religious debate, but in particular, coming from the networking space, there are some properties of pull which are next to impossible or super hard to to emulate in push based system, unless the push-based system has complete information of, of everything which should be sending data, at which point pulling is more efficient. Anyway, um, white box, black box monitoring, one looks at the thing from the outside without further information, whereas white box monitoring looks at all the innards. You instrument your code, you emit data from internal. Um, every service should have its own metrics and endpoint um, with things like the Prometheus agent, um, which we announced today with my Prometheus team hat on. Um, look at the blog on Prometheus.io slash blog. Um, we, uh, we can also accumulate this data for you and then even push it to, to other backends. Um, yeah. And super hard API commits, stronger than anything I've ever seen in my life, maybe except for the Linux kernel. Time series, yeah, most certainly, except for the Linux kernel, at least defined as user interfaces, which are not deprecated. Anyway, uh, what are time series? Um, recorded values which change over time. For example, the temperature in your room, that's a time series. You usually merge those individual events of, I don't know, tens of thousands of people accessing that thing uh, into counters and their histograms. Um, typical examples would be requests to a web server, temperatures, service latency, this kind of thing. It's super easy to emit, parse, and read. That's literally how it looks on the wire. So it's like I know people who print F in their C code and then just dump that file onto a web server and that's how they instrument their code and it works. Like there are easier ways, but for them that works and it's totally fine. Scaling, Kubernetes is Borg, Prometheus is Borg one. So um, yeah, scale is, is kind of built in. Prometheus and Kubernetes are designed and written with each other in mind. Borg and Borgmon again. Um, yeah. Just looking at Prometheus, um, I have a typo. There is a two missing in that in that sentence. Um, so, roughly a hundred, uh, one million samples per second is not a problem in current hardware. Two hundred k samples per second in core is is roughly where we're at, um, but that's is already slightly old. And the single largest uh, Prometheus instance which we saw in production was one hundred twenty five million active time series, like we as in Prometheus team. Um, I know of someone who ran it at five, 700 million. So um, yeah, it's kind of scalable, um, but it's also painful at that point. You probably want Cortex or Thanos or something. Speaking of, um, there's two uh, two projects which have high overlap with, uh, with Prometheus team members, um, Thanos and Cortex. Historically, Thanos is easier to run and scales storage horizontally. Cortex is a lot easier to run these days, and it started with scaling uh, store, uh, ingesters and querying horizontally. It took the code of, uh, of Thanos to also scale uh, storage horizontally. Guess what Thanos is working on with uh, ingesting and querying? Um, data from, uh, from, from Grafana itself, um, the largest single cluster. It's not all of Grafana, just one cluster, um, but that's already old data we have higher numbers now, um, 65 million active series at a cost of 668 CPU cores and 3.4 gigs of RAM. Um, one customer is running at 3 billion, but that's kind of more than pushing it, but it did not completely die in a fire. Loki, uh, it 
is basically like Prometheus, but for logs. So it follows all the same design principles. It has the same label-based system. It has the same indexing type. Um, it takes tons of code from, uh, from Cortex um, for kind of obvious reasons. The nice thing is you don't need a full text index. Of course, usually if you work on logs, you don't need every last bit and piece of your thing indexed. Most often you're able to, uh, to extract a few relevant uh, bits and pieces of, of information. You index that, you search on that, and the rest is just an opaque string, which is, which is stored without indexing, which means you have a lot less overhead and cost in storage, and in particular in indexing and in, in lookups. Um, you can work at scale, like significant scale. Sorry. And one of the nice properties, which are initially non-obvious to a lot of users, is um, as you use literally the same label-based system as Prometheus, it's trivial to, to turn your logs into metrics, to extract metrics from your logs for alerting, graphing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, basically pre-processing or processing logs into metrics again. Remember, same like uh, internet scale two decades ago, that's kind of the same trick, which is literally the same thing where a lot of single events were turned into metrics and then just the metrics exposed. In Loki, you have that mechanism built in, which is super nice and except for Google's mTAIL, which kind of was dead even when it was released, something which which we haven't seen in, in the open source or in the open world, like certain search engines and such have this internally, but not uh, not others prior to Loki at least. And you can pump basically all type of, of, of text-based information into, into uh, Loki. One of the lead devs at Welsh even puts um, his, his uh, car telemetry and pictures from his dash cam into Loki course. He can and he likes to. Because again, the content back here is unindexed which means you can just put whatever in and it's just an opaque string or blob uh, to be precise. You might remember uh, the Prometheus exposition format we saw earlier or the open metrics format, which we saw earlier. Um, that's literally the same with the labels here. Uh, you just need a timestamp. Of course, obviously an event is, is always at a specific point in time. Um, so you need to emit that specific point in time. Whereas um, the metrics are handled differently on a conceptual level, you can emit uh, precise timestamps, but usually for mathematical reasons, which we are not going into here, um, it's it's better to to have Prometheus or Cortex or Thanos handle, handle the timestamping versus with Loki, it's better to have the emitter handle the timestamping. Um, some numbers, um, our queries at, at Grafana Labs regularly see 40 gigs uh, per second, uh, gigabytes per second. Um, I know that we already at, at rough production see 80 gigs uh, due to a new way how we how we um, scale our queries, um, which means you can go through insane amounts of data within a super short time. We regularly query terabytes of data in under a minute. Um, ideally, you then emit this back into metrics so you don't have to do those expensive or relatively expensive queries regularly. You can just, what you really care about, already emit into metrics. And then again, you reduce um, total amount of information, also uh, computational complexity by orders of magnitude. Tempo, the last of the bunch. Um, with open metrics, um, there was another thing which which was brought into the open, which was before that basically limited to uh, to Google. Um, with my open metrics hat on, when we were talking ages ago about potentially merging open census and open metrics, um, one of the things which stuck with me is when when the Googlers mentioned how how searching for for traces didn't scale, and when Google tells you that searching doesn't scale, searching for something. Um, you better listen, which which I did. So exemplars are just an ID. You have an ID for a trace and you attach that to the trace. But you also attach that ID to a, a metric or to a log line. So now you know that a relevant metric or relevant log line carries a trace with it. 
and you don't have to have this needle and haystack problem where you um, where you have to search through all your traces or live analysis uh, do a live analysis on your traces to deduce what the properties of that particular traces. Um, you already know that this is a relevant thing. Of course, it came from that high latency bucket where I don't know your P99 was two seconds, what have you, doesn't matter. But you know you have a high latency there. You know you had that one error. You know you had that one security exception, what have you. And you know that this one trace is relevant to the thing which you're currently working on and which you saw in your logs or your metrics. So you don't need to search. You don't need to switch mental context all the time trying to walk through a ton of traces or spans. You simply, from your metrics, from your logs, where you already know that something is relevant, jump into your traces. Super nice. Um, they are built into pretty much everything which we're talking about. Um, of course, kind of obvious. They're nice. <laughs> but Temple also... Um, also allows you to search. Uh, of course, some users and some use cases just require searching of, of more or less raw um, traces and spans. My own personal opinion, at some point, it would be nice to optimize this out if, if you need to do search as of today. Um, but if you need to rely on search going forward, that's also completely doable. Better uh, would be if, if you go through exemplars because it's just so much more efficient. Only works in object storage. You don't need Cassandra Elastic, anything expensive in the background. Um, give it an object store and you're done. Um, it's compatible with all the things, open telemetry tracing, Sipkin, Jaeger. Um, by default, we are not uh, sampling. Uh, you can sample if you want to, but we don't sample. Um, I also need to update that slide, I see. Um, Chris, as of four months ago, which is eons in, in this uh, production velocity, uh, we had over 2 million samples per second at 350 megabytes per second. And we have 14-day retention, three copies stored at a cost of 240 CPU, 400 gigs, uh, 450 gigs of RAM, and 132 terabytes of object storage. And the P99 of 2.5. Um, it's better already, but like tempo scales, and it scales insanely high. Bringing all of this together, um, this this more holistic thing allows you to jump from logs to traces, from metrics to traces, from traces to logs, and all the all the other um, different ways. Um, of course, it, like it's literally designed for each other. And while they are all distinct projects, and you're not forced to use all of them to to reap benefits, if you so choose, um, you get you get the most bang for your non bug. Um, of course, a um, those things have been designed for each other and. Personally speaking, since at least 2015, I have been working towards having those three things for metrics, logs, and traces as a holistic thing. So there is a long-running underlying design. Um, as to the bang for the buck, all of this is open source. You can run it yourself. Um, I like food and shelter, so you're also more than welcome to go to Grafana Cloud or, or buy Enterprise or what have you. Um, and there's some more features. Rough sniff test, if the user, the intended user, has more money than time, um, it tends to be a paid feature. If they have more time than money, it tends to be open source. Like that's roughly the 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 sniff test for our monetization strategy. Again, most or anything we talked about right now is completely open source. You can run it yourself. A few screenshots. Most of you know how um, how uh, Grafana looks, but still. Um, those blue lines are relatively new and super nice. You can have events, you can have um, you can have uh, your alerts, you can have things like this, which uh, which give you a lot more context. You can also have exemplars visualized and things like this, um, and tons of other visualizations. As just last week, we had uh, Observability Con 2021 online, obviously. Um, a lot of what we just talked about, you can find uh, in more depth. Uh, without that rush to to cover as many questions as possible um, at this location, grafanacon slash go anyone. Um, that's also part of the slides. It's even a click. Thank you very much. Uh, you can post talks uh, on GitHub, like all of them for the last decade or so. Um, email, Twitter are there for your per user. And let's see what we have as questions. 
Um, do we get created questions and they're read out or how does it work? I honestly don't know, sorry, I didn't. Uh, anyone with a question, just drop it into the chat and Richard can okay. take a look at it as they come in. Sounds good. And we'll go from there. Good, good. So there are currently no questions, which means I wouldn't have had to hurry as much. I can also ad lib and go into more detail on other stuff, but do ask questions if you have any. How to orchestrate apps to integrate with uh, Grafana Cloud. Um, can you orchestrate is, can you expand on what you mean with orchestrate? Because I think you're mixing on the one hand your own orchestration of application versus um, how to how to emit data towards Grafana Cloud. I can try and have have a a partial uh, reply as as to the second part of that question. How I understand it. Um, the easiest way for, for most things is the Grafana agent, um, which is what the Prometheus agent, which was released today, uh, is based upon. Um, of course, this allows you to uh, to channel all your, your signals uh, towards Grafana Cloud. Um, if you have any of the other interfaces, like the common ones, um, they're all supported. Um, like ideally, you, you put things somehow into, into um, Prometheus Remote Write um, to, to emit towards Grafana Cloud if it's metrics. Um, for traces, uh, open telemetry tracing is, is the gold standard, so you should absolutely do this. Um, if you have non-Prometheus things, um, there's an exporter for pretty much, or for probably everything on the market. Uh, to get data into Prometheus format, and then you can use the agent or other mechanisms to um, to push towards Grafana Cloud if you want to. Um, the Open Telemetry Collector also supports Prometheus Remote Write, so you can also use this. Um, yeah, pretty much everything which which is on the market is supported. Uh, Promtail and such for Loki and everything is built into into the uh, Grafana agent. If you just want the bare bones open metrics to um, to Prometheus Remote Write Pipeline, uh, the Prometheus agent is better if you want built-in um, exporters, if you want Promptail, if you want to have open telemetry tracing, all those things built into a single binary, the Grafana agent is better. Depends on your trade-off. Some deployment models like to have a single huge binary, which does pretty much everything. Other deployment models mandate that you have tons of smaller services. Both is valid, both is covered. Um, are there Docker images available? Um, yes, for everything, as far as I, I'm aware. Um, if not, focus on on CNCF Slack or on, on Grafana Community Slack or shoot me a message. Um, but I would be surprised if we don't have up-to-date Docker images for everything, I'm, I'm certain we do. Um, do you have an off-the-shelf Helm chart for uh, getting this whole setup? Um, I think we do. Um, there's tons of work on, in our integration crew and we're hiring like crazy for the integrations crew um, where all of this is made more seamless. Internally, we use Tanker, which uh, is JSONnet, which is then compiled um, into um, into Helm and others and also is able to, to ingest Helm charts, which means you don't have this common problem of... Um, of having those super static slash brittle helm charts, which are hard to to change and and hard to to track, in particular if you have both upstream changes and your own local changes, where you functionally need to fork pretty much everything and and carry your own forks if you if you need to do anything more than than really baseline changes. I suggest you look uh, you look at Tanker and and JSON it. Um, I can drop uh, the URL into into chat in a few. Um, which is a lot more malleable and also allows you to define other things like uh, like alerts and such, and you all have this in one uh, one language JSON, it, which is quite nice. How to integrate apps to send metrics or emit data to Grafana Cloud? Um, depends on the type of, of, well, okay, no, you said metrics, not signals, sorry. Um, wait, okay, let's go with metrics and then with data. Metrics, um, Prometheus client libraries, um, 
is the gold standard for for emitting um, metrics as of today. Um, for uh, data defined as as traces, uh, open telemetry tracing is the gold standard. For uh, logs, it doesn't really matter. Um, of course, logs is just historically kind of a mess, as most of you will probably agree. Um, so Promtail can ingest pretty much everything and just hammer it into shape for um, for Loki to consume. Um, again, all of this is built into the Grafana agent. Um, but for for your own applications, when you need to emit the actual raw data from your own code and you need to instrument your own code for metrics, Prometheus client libraries, for uh, traces, open telemetry tracing, and for uh, logs, it doesn't really matter because Promptail eats it all. Um, how does correlation happen between Loki logs and tempo traces? So um, going from your logs to your traces, the ideal case is you have an exemplar on your on your logs, there you know that your ID for uh, for that trace or that span or both exemplars support support uh, free form text. So, as per WC 3s um, tracing uh, standard, uh, we support both uh, span and and um, trace ID. Um, and that modeling is also coming in large part from how Google did it internally. Like a lot of this has a history from there. So it tends to already work nicely with each other. Um, and you just toss that in. And once Loki is aware that yes, this is an exemplar, you can ju just jump to your trace storage and, and just go there. Um, there's also an inverse index where you can look up um, trace IDs or exemplars. If you have one and you need to see that one log line, uh, you can also go the other way, which is of particular interest if you if you came to your trace or your span through a search within Tempo. Of course, then that exemplar is is like the shortcut back into into your logs or metrics. Should Kubernetes applications slash services be designed in any particular way to use these tools? What is a good starting point to integrate these tools to custom Kubernetes services running in a cluster? Great question. Uh, and it's not basic, not at all. For Prometheus slash the others, it's super simple. Um, Prometheus, um, I touched on this, but it didn't go in depth, it has a thing called service discovery. Um, which is just an interface where Prometheus understands how other services run their thing. Uh, first and foremost, Kubernetes. But there's also things like uh, text files where you just write YAML and, and populate your, your service discovery. For anyone uh, more on the networking side, zone transfer is, is possible. So you have your bind or whatever unbound uh, DNS server. Um, allow zone transfers by Prometheus and it just ingests the complete zone and just starts monitoring or scraping everything which is defined in that in that zone. And again, that is also the case for, for Kubernetes. So you literally just point your Prometheus at your Kubernetes and you tell your Kubernetes that yes, this thing uh, may, may get the data. And automatically, Prometheus gets all the data from that Kubernetes cluster with, or from the pods like the services internal, blah, 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 uh, might be different depending on your precise setup. Maybe you need a sidecar, blah, 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 the usual. But for the pods itself and such, all that is automatically emitted, um, which is super nice. Of course, it's literally one thing to set up and automatically you have all that data in your local Prometheus. If you don't want to have local storage or you have issues with uh, state, which was the reason why we created the Prometheus operator ages ago to, to handle state uh, within, within Kubernetes, you can also just run the Grafana or the Prometheus agent and just shove all that data uh, into e.g. Grafana Cloud or one of the other Prometheus compatible um, offerings. Speaking of Prometheus compatibility, also on the Prometheus blog, again, Prometheus IO slash blog, um, we did start a uh, Prometheus with my Prometheus head on. We did start a Prometheus compliance uh, thing there or Prometheus conformance thing there if you are compliant to the relevant APIs and, and service interfaces, um, you get certified as Prometheus compatible, which means for the users that you actually know that a thing is Prometheus compatible and and you can um, just use it without fear of, of something breaking. 
um, Prometheus Cortex, uh, Grafana Cloud are Prometheus compatible. Do you have any best practices, blueprints for self-managed Grafana slash Prometheus slash Loki setup? Any best practices to optimize performance? Um, depends a little bit on your scale. So if you have normal scale, like if, if you're working at a huge company or you run a team and they have, I don't know how many users, blah, 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 blah. That is not as applicable, but if you have normal sized amounts of data, um, it's pretty easy because um, you just start a Prometheus or a Cortex or a Thanos. Um, Cortex and Prometheus have single binary modes where you just start the binary and, and you're done. In this case, I would recommend uh, Prometheus myself if you get started. Um, Loki also has a single binary mode tempo as well. Um, so you just start those binaries and you can just uh, you can just start uh, ingesting data into those systems. Um, as for Prometheus, um, I would suggest the documentation on Prometheus IO. As to Grafana Cloud, Loki, Tempo, I would suggest the documentation on Grafana Com. Um, those are the best ones. Digital Ocean also has quite a few um, super nice Prometheus tutorials, which are, I think, four years old, but they are super nicely written. So, um, yeah. Also, we are extending the uh, tutorial uh, section on Prometheus IO. So, yeah. Duck, duck, duck. Does Prometheus integrate with tools like Istio? Um, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to give a wrong answer so I can follow up and uh, shoot me an email or something. I'll I'll get you the authoritative answer from Robert or from Joe, sorry, not from Robert and, and before I say something wrong. 13 more minutes and no questions. This is your chance. Any other questions? Have we stalled out? Seems like. Do you want to include a Slack channel or something in the chat, Richard um, or Julie, just to for any follow up questions, anything like that? Yeah, we have the. Uh, I mean, for. We have to split this for Cortex and Prometheus. Um, you have you have the CNCF Slack. Um, I do. Let me put let me put ours in and uh, um, online programs. And then if anybody has any other questions, you can hit each other up here. Yep. And also and let me search for the Grafana Slack. The Grafana. If that is it, Slack. then we can break. The right one. There we go. And also, let me link your phone with Tenko. Tenko. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone, for um, hanging in there with us as we got things started. A little bit of a rough, rough start, but. Um, I think this was a great one and you got tons of great questions and let's keep those conversations rolling and um, thank you again. And the recordings will be up in a little bit uh, this afternoon. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone. Thank for you attending. so much. Thanks everyone. Yeah.